Thank you, Kit. Oh, I really appreciate your time. It's a, a pleasure to chat with you and learn from your huge journey, several books, your approaches to stretching as a therapy and the tools that you need to individualise outcomes for people with arthritis, for people with any musculoskeletal condition. Uh, I know that, you know, we've spoken about RSI in the past. All of those things that affect mind and therefore bodies and they're interrelated, I love that approach. So uh, I'm hoping to learn from how your journey started and where you've ended up and what we can take from that for people who are just starting their journey in becoming body aware. So right. in, in a nutshell, what, what would you um, tell people about your journey that could be useful to them? Well, I'll, I'll leave my journey until slightly later, if I may, because... Sure. This is just to ensure that people don't click away from what we're talking about, but for anyone yeah. with any kind of physical problem, and remember, and as you've already touched on this, if you have a physical problem for long enough, it becomes a mental problem too, as, as yeah. we all know. There are two strands to our approach that can have the most seemingly miraculous effect, and in particular with respect to the particular uh, difficulty that you are dealing with on a daily basis, arthritis. The, the nexus, if you like, for any kind of physical condition and how stretching as a therapy can actually affect that condition beneficially is actually about reduction of resting muscle tonus. In other words, the practice of stretching in time leads to a physically softer body, it reduces the tension in the muscles of all of the body and the result of that is there's simply less tension on the joints themselves. And as you know, all, all articular cartilage uh, is nerve rich, it has a pain signalling component to it, nociceptive structures as they're called. Yes. And, and any time you reduce tension around the shoulders or the neck or the jaw or anywhere else in the body, the experience of pain and the frequency of pain and the severity of it decreases. There is absolutely no doubt that is the case. So the reason I mentioned and wanted to start here is the dimension of our work that literally m most people forget about is the relaxation dimension. In the first book I wrote, Overcome Neck and Back Pain, the relaxation aspect was, des was described as one of the three pillars to the approach and it's still one of the main three pillars of the approach. And, yes. and for elderly people and for people who are not physically able um, and who might not want to get into stretching exercises straight away, might want to take the, the, the approach on trial, if you like, and see whether yes. or not there's actually anything useful to it. Yes. We, we have over 150 free recordings on our site, some of them recorded in the Buddhist monasteries where I've been teaching, and in, in that context it's called lying meditation or lying relaxation, and all people do is go onto the site, find a script that they have, where the description will tell you what's inside it, um, find one that they like, download it onto their phones and simply do that relaxation practice every day for a month. Now, yes. we, we offer money back guarantees, of course, because we don't charge anything for these things. But, <laughs> but the, the fact is, anyone who actually does a daily relaxation practice for a month will find their life change substantially. The first thing that they'll notice is their sleep improves and anyone that's got any kind of physical problem one of the first things I'll complain about, as you know, I mean, you've heard yes. this many, many times, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about RSI, arthritis, back pain, neck pain or whatever, they'll say the worst aspect of the problem is that it really affects my sleep. I can't sleep well or I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about whatever is concerning the mind on that day. Yes. This is typical. Waking up at three o'clock in the morning is, is just the, probably the most common sleep problem that I've heard from patients spanning a 30-year period now. Yes. Well, what, what we have found is that the relaxation practice, which is best done before you go to sleep, so just before you go to sleep is ideal, but sometime in the afternoon, or as long as, I guess I would say as long as it's roughly the same time each day for that month, that will help build the habit because, and again this is news to most people, relaxation is simply an alternative habit for the body. Yes. Pe people's habitual tension is a habit that they don't know that they've learned. 
But the, yes. fact is, the fact is, most people are tense most of the time. They're quick to anger, they're quick to get frustrated, they're quick to feel depressed or quick to react in some way. But when, yeah. you, when you add this very simple element of a 15-minute or 20-minute relaxation practice every day, you find that the, the innate reactivity of the person to go off on those little reaction journeys, I call them, they're diminished in addition to sleeping better. And so the whole combination of this package, and this is only doing the relaxation stuff I'm talking about now, not talking yes. about the stretching, that's a whole further dimension, which, yes. which also adds to the same effect because they both have the effect of reducing muscle tonus. The, the people who report um, doing this practice for a month and best, we say in our work, for three months, if you're really serious about making a change in your life, the vast majority of people, in fact, everyone who makes it to the end of that one month or three month journey will say, you're right, it has absolutely changed my life. I'm sleeping better now. I feel better now. A bit more optimistic about things. Um, I don't see my problems as quite so serious anymore and a whole range of things along those lines. And of course, the backstory is that the individual has taken some control over his or her life. Yes. This is profoundly important. And yes. so, and so, if we talk about the second strand of the approach now, the stretching strand, <coughs> where we have specific stretches for specific joints and for, for particular problems, make developing the habit of doing some stretching exercises once or twice a week, and that's all we recommend for beginners anyway, because yes. a stretch is like any kind of a workout, you need to recover from it, and the recovery is what produces the effects that we regard as a benefit, not the stretching itself. Yes. Um, the combination of doing some physical stretching, and all our important stretches are free on YouTube too, by the way. We've got 100 and, I think it's 160 videos up there now. There's no advertising, um, they're self-contained, they, they're, the explanation is, is detailed and full. And it's not a case where we, we're just using YouTube as being a, you know, a kind of a basically trying to sell our other products. We do have products for sale as well. But and look, I, I must say that that was what attracted me as a you know an early instructor 20 years ago to your work was that your book overcome neck and back pain had that detailed description that people could relate to their bodies and it was the first one that had a page description on each stretch yes. so it people could understand it because uh, unless you understand then you can't apply it to your own body as an individual and that's the trickiest thing about any exercise realm it needs to be individualized to oh. your circumstances so um, it's it's wonderful that you're doing that and with all of the the free uh, stuff people will even then not have to wade through it and wade through they'll be able yeah. to see at a glance what's useful to them so yeah. that that's terrific yeah well look um I adopt the 50-year test in all decision-making that affects our business and our life. And the 50-year test is, who'll give up in 50 years? Yes. And, and the answer always is, well, actually, <laughs> no one will be thinking about these things in 50 years. So then I fall back on what I call my second-order decision process, which is a very simple question. What's the decision that I or Olivia can make that will have the greatest benefit for the greatest number of people involved? Simple as that. And, I mean... I guess the, the deep reason for me about all of these things is I want to be able to sleep at night myself. And when we see when we see our own leaders and the world the world's leaders behaving like children and spoiled children at that and totally selfish and self centered spoiled children, if I may yeah. say, um, it's a clear indication that this is this is a fruitless direction. It's not a direction for any human being to want to aspire to or to go in. And so we decided a long time ago not to. Just not to. Yes. We don't do that. Full stop. Look, that that's wonderful, and I I um, just would like to ask you your recent and and I, I had a laugh when you mentioned to me um, that meditation uh, teaching it in the Buddhist context is like selling coal to Newcastle. It's sort of. Um, why do you think you've been so successful in that realm? Well. This, this is a very, for me personally, extremely interesting question because um, I ask myself the same question. Yes. But what it is, the, the guy that I co-present with, his name is Patrick Carney, um, mm -hmm. and you can look him up on the net, it's K-E-A-R-N-E-Y, he's a lovely man. He was a monk for several years um, in Burma, so he robed, he um, 
eschewed all you know worldly goods, blah blah blah. Went into a monastery, uh, severed connections with everything in the West, and he was a, a monk for quite a long while. I think six years in all, something like that. And he had the benefit of, of absolutely brilliant meditation teachers in Burma as well as Thailand and other places. Uh, and he was also one of my students long ago at the Australian National University. So this is oh, a really, really? absolutely it's a remarkable sort of uh, closing the circle story. Yes, and, and those classes are still going, aren't they? Not not at the university, but at they the are in Canberra. Yes, in Canberra, yes. In Canberra, all the teachers that had a presence in Canberra, the majority of those people are still teaching in Canberra separately in different facilities. It's an amazing thing. That's great. And and so you met um, met Mr. Kearney back then. Yeah. So he so was a, he was actually a long. A, a, sorry, if we talked over each other, then and one of the one of the difficult features of Skype is that if I talk and you're talking it will actually cut you off and vice versa so let me let me just briefly tell you the Patrick story he was one of yeah. my students a long time ago probably 20 25 years ago when we were running those classes at the ANU I was a PhD scholar student and he was as well um, and we met and we became friends and then he disappeared I didn't see him I don't think it was for 20 years and I got a call from him one day he and he said uh, Pat it's Patrick here I said oh well, it's great to hear from you Patrick he said, I need your help. Well, I said, oh, well, come on, come on, we'll talk about it. So we met in at the ANU, in, the, in our facility, and I said, so what's going on? And he said, look, I've just come back from a, I think it was a two or three month retreat in Thailand, and he said, an old monk that I was working with, who is 87 now, I think, from memory, he said, he revealed to me that he had had his major insights meditating between the ages of 75 and 77. And Patrick looked at me and he said, I don't think my body's going to last the distance. And I just cracked up. <laughs> and I said, no, man, you, you're going to have to start to look after this structure. And he has now. He has completely changed um, himself physically. But what he realized in the process of learning how to become a bit more flexible, and because when you sit cross-legged, as you have to sit for meditation, um, if you're not loose enough in the hips, it's, uh, it's actually quite hard. To, well, you actually have to hold yourself straight instead of being able to organise yourself so that you can sit straight and be completely yes. relaxed in the process. Yes. Um, and also, um, in his case, he had a bit of a knee problem as well. And it was because he was not able to externally rotate that hip joint enough and put that leg on the floor. So anyway, yep. all those things were taken care of relatively easily. And then he said to me, well, this approach that you have to body work, he said, you know, when the Buddha spoke about meditation, he didn't just talk about sitting meditation, which is the meditation or the flavor of meditation that has captured the Western imagination. I yeah. said, I, and I knew this, but I wanted him to explain it anyway. So I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there's a sutta, a very famous sutra um, in Sanskrit, sutta in Pali. He said, there's a very famous uh, sutra, which uh, is called the Satipatthana Sutra, and it talks about the four postures of meditation. Standing, okay. moving, sitting, yeah and lying. Okay. They are all the postures where meditation is said to be able to be effectively practiced. And of course, if you think about it, what that means is, and I think this is the, the subtext, the subtext is, well, there's actually no time when you're not doing one of those four things, so there's no time when you can't be aware and be present and practice. And yeah. personally, I think that's true. But having said that, for Western people who are habitually extremely tense compared to Asian people, and I'm speaking here about people, when I say Asian people, I'm not talking about people who live in Singapore or, or Hong Kong where the pressure mm. is even more than it is in Sydney or, or London or New York, probably. I'm yep. talking about people that live traditionally and rurally in Asia, which is still the majority of the population there. And we have to include Sri Lanka and India there too because they are, that's the birthplace of Buddhism after all, India. Yeah. Um, what you find when you when you work with a group of beginners, and we've worked with many groups of beginners now, you find that those people are simply nowhere near as tense as the average Western person is. And this, of course, is one of the reasons why we have the diseases of Western civilization, yeah. which is, how, is what started our conversation. One yes. of the great characteristics of Western civilization is that people are tense, they're aggressive, they experience their life as difficult, um, and everything is a push, 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 pushing back against the perceived encroachment of other people or whatever it is that they're pushing back against. But everyone's pushing back against something. Yeah. But when you come across someone who, whose daily life revolves around working in a rice field, 
you just simply get a whole different way of thinking about things. But nonetheless, um, so what so what Patrick and I, what I concentrate on in Patrick and I's workshop, or Patrick and my workshop is this, I concentrate on the line relaxation part because for most of our students who are Chinese, they've never done any line relaxation practice. They've never done it yeah. before. And yeah. line relaxation can be structured to produce a particular result in the body. And not only that, connecting to your physical self rather than treating meditation as, as a mental object, which it, it's possible to do that, but if you connect to the physical sensations in your body, and our stretching work and our lying relaxation work is all about connecting to the physical sensations in the body, it profoundly changes your relationship to your own body and brings about some of those effects I mentioned before, tying this back into your arthritis group, um, the sorts of problems that people struggle with on a daily basis. If you're in pain and you're in discomfort and you're experiencing your life as stressful then number one learn how to relax and not as a concept for example if I just reached out through the, the phone now and said to you now Janine you must relax you'll say you look at me and you say what do you mean I am relaxed that's that's the <laughs> typical western response right yeah but but, yeah. but and we say until you've actually experienced deep relaxation you don't actually know what being being relaxed is like and it's a waste yeah. of time for anyone to suggest to you that you need to relax you yes. won't. You don't know how to do it. It's like don't if you don't yet. know how to do chin-ups, it, it yep. doesn't matter if someone extols the virtue of a chin-up for you and tells you how to have this effect and that effect, and it'll be great. And if you don't know, if you can't even jump up and and hang on that bar, for example, with your own weight, then you're wasting your breath. Yes. So we don't do that. What we do instead is we help people create in themselves the experience of being deeply relaxed, and after they've experienced that once. I tell you, no one needs convincing. Yes. They, they realize, ah, God, that feels absolutely fantastic in the body. That yes. feels fantastic in the body. I want more of that. And then they can connect with it and know how to come back to it. Yes. yes. Oh, that's actually, that's a very good, that point is a subtle point. Let me just talk about that briefly. Sure. The biggest advantage for me personally, because... And you've known me for a very long time now, but I am a completely different person now to the person I used to be. And I yes. know this. I used to be a very angry person. And when people listen to me talk now, they I have had so many people write to me and say, I can't believe that you're an angry person because you don't sound like an angry person. And I say, I don't sound like an angry person now, but I used to be. You could hear the repressed tension and the tightness in my throat and the I'm just controlling myself from exploding kind of attitude physical and mental yes. and and vocal as well but when i learned i spent a long time i take a, another part of my journey now which might be relevant here i spent six months on retreat in taos new mexico a wonderful place okay. and i was working with a particular teacher there who encouraged me to explore a, a, a an intuition a feeling that i had that learning how to relax properly was somehow going to be useful to me Mm -hmm. Now he was a Tibetan Buddhism teacher, and without going into the the the, the realms and the techno techniques and also arguments between different schools of Buddhism, their speciality is something called samatha meditation, whereas the Burmese and the Thai their their kind of meditation called vipassana or insight meditation. And insight meditation has captured the, the Western attention because it's something that's done with the mind and because we all have very active minds that's something that we can relate to Samatha is something completely different it's actually about experiencing the body in the continually unfolding present so okay. for, for, for and that's why I had this feeling that somehow getting closer to trying to find out what it was that my body actually wanted or, or to put it another way I wanted to try and find out could I understand why my body was so tense why I was so reactive. What is it underneath the expression of anger that my body was trying to express? Okay. And so that's the kind of person I am, as you know, I'm an explorer. And, yes. so, and so I did lying relaxation practice, probably four or five sessions a day, plus sitting meditation, one or two hours usually, each day for six months. Mm. And, and that process completely changed my body. It became really soft. Yes. Um, in, on workshops, I, uh, for example, I say to people, okay, you all think you're relaxed, I'm standing here, relaxed, 
come over here and feel my body. And I'll I invite people over in the workshop to feel my body. And, and men and women will sort of poke their fingers into my body and say, oh my God, it feels like butter. What? How, how can you be standing up and be relaxed? And it's a very simple thing I say because there's no need to be tense in this moment. We're on a workshop. Yes. We're on a workshop. We're safe. Uh -huh. We're surrounded by people we like. Blah, blah, yes. blah. So my set point, if you like, I was able to reset it at a much lower state of tension, still being able to be really strong and fast and all the things that I that we both like to do. That doesn't affect that at all. But I love the word reset. I think people can relate to that. And you can still be strong, oh. but be relaxed and yes. reset into that meditative mode. Yes, yes. Okay. And look, with um, you, you mentioned anger. If the source of the anger was frustration or whether it's um, trauma or whether it's, it's pain, does that change the approach you take? So no. it's still the one approach. That's Here, the, right. the, the, the approach that we take, and this is not my approach, it's um, Eckhart Tolle who wrote the book, The Power of Now. It's his approach. It's also the Buddha's approach. It's the approach of anyone who does any kind of work that we we loosely and I think rather these days pejoratively label as spiritual work. I, I don't use that term at all. Um, in, yes. fact, in fact, it was my, my partner, then wife now, uh, Olivia, who said we were talking about working with a particular teacher or the possibility of working with a particular teacher. And she said to me, darling, I'm not interested in this stuff. I'm only interested in practices that will help me to be a better human being. And I thought, yeah. wow. Yes. That, well, that is actually, you know what, that's exactly why I'm interested in these practices too. All yes. the other stuff are details. I'm interested in how to be a better human being. So once that's you, wonderful. It is wonderful. It is a wonderful thing and it's a simple thing. It's a, yes. a not special thing, a not spectacular thing. It's certainly not, you know, positioning myself as some kind of enlightened being or any of those kinds of things. That, that those, yes. those, how about just be a decent human being first? How about we just start yes. there? And I thought, yes. you know what, that's an immensely difficult thing to do. Well, in, or yes. at least on one account, it's a difficult thing to do. And why? Well, th there are many reasons why. But the, the big reason is the culture that we find ourselves in, which is about being profitable, making money, being successful. And the Dalai Lama said something recently. It's just a beautiful thing. Um, and it's, we, we cut it out from, I think it was on Facebook, and we cut it out and put it on our fridge. He said, the Dalai Lama said, the world does not need more successful people. It needs mm -hmm. more considerate people, more loving people, people who dance, people who teach, people who care. That's what the world yeah. needs more of. And w well, that, that, that just encapsulated this approach. That's what we think too, that's all. So nothing special. No, oh, look, that's wonderful. And I, I know Olivia's been with you on that journey right from the start, I still yep. remember her as flexible as she was, able to relate as both a teacher and, um, you know, a, a, a person who helped you with your whole approach and your journey and how yeah. you've gone from stretching through, under, teaching people to understand strength and how to approach the individualization, which therefore takes that innate knowledge of biomechanics and specifics. Yeah. Yes, but absolutely. For Buy it within a simple context. Mm. I, I guess um, where I think most people um, have difficulty is is understanding how to apply to their own bodies. So, is there any best way you've found over the years to help people relax into that, and not try hard and think of you know as we do often repetitions of, of exercise or how long you're doing it at, but just how to do yes in Are fact there any cues yes there, yes most definitely in fact the how to do is far and away the most important part uh we always well i, I did a little bit of a digression here but uh we work with lots of um uh athletes who are doing something called calisthenics or something called gymnastic strength training men's gymnastic strength training so yeah. exercising on the roman ring and parallel bars and all those kinds of things where both of those disciplines and also pole dancing too those three disciplines require an extreme level of flexibility so yeah. we, have, we have people writing to us saying look we would like to do some work with you but 
actually, we can't, I can't touch my toes. So we say, well, <laughs> you know, I, I, I imagine you're, you're trying to do this particular exercise, trying to do that particular exercise, and you can't even get into the starting position of it. Is that about right? And they all say, yes. I say, okay, well, yeah. why don't we leave that as a goal for now? And, and certainly it's a very desirable goal. And I've done plenty of that kind of training myself, as you know. Let's leave yes. that for now and let's work out, firstly, how to be comfortable in your own body. Now, this is such a radical change of focus for most people. It also plays into the, the, the recommendation of learning how to relax because those two things, they're, if you like, two halves of a whole. Yeah. And, that's, and that's why we say on our website, uh, grace and ease in the body and yeah. more efficient movement. It doesn't sound like much of a goal. But in fact, it's not how most people experience their own bodies. And so we're yeah. interested in experiencing our body in this way, where our, our body is a blessing to us rather than a curse or an yeah. impediment as most people experience their body. Oh my God, I can't tie my shoes and socks up anymore. I can't bend down to do this. I can't play with my grandchildren. All the things that people construct in their heads about the things that they can't do especially mm. the aging population which is the largest yeah. growing group in the australian population as you yeah. know yes well we say okay let us show you the beginners exercises for mobilizing the spine let's start there cat exercises dog exercises little mobilization exercises exercises that people even if they can't get down on the floor they can do them all in a chair we have those programs yes. that's where you start and what we find, and this is so often the case, someone will start, we've got a, a series called the Absolute Beginner Stretching Series, and Olivia teaches the first four, I think, and I teach the last one in the series of five. And she literally starts at the beginning. That's it. it we, we, we broke all of our work down to the absolute most bite-sized chunks possible, and literally anyone, Janine, can start there. Anyone. It doesn't matter what disability you have, it doesn't matter what limitations you have. We have people who have only one leg, we have people who are confined to wheelchairs. Yeah. I mean, I mean, talking about the extreme of the end of the range of movement and to the other end of the range of movement, even someone who is flexible like yourself, this, is, yeah. come, this comes as a real surprise to most people, even someone who's flexible gets an immensely good effect out of doing complete beginner's exercises because you oh, absolutely like me can explore yeah. different things in because those things are not a challenge for us so there's actually other things to be explored there absolutely. that's so exciting and i guess that's um the the one thing that i i've applied from since working with you many years ago the simple basics are the single most important and even after 30 years of teaching I teach beginners level because people know how to adapt once they know about the angles and all of those little things that you know your website's so good at at um, verbalizing in a way that people can understand then it's the basics that are the most important everything else is just to just to know that you can do them sets a bar so that if you start not being able to do them you know you know there's something that you can be working on there so absolutely um, yeah it's a, it's a wonderful thing and i think for people to understand that the basics are the most important may empower them to start when they'd otherwise be hesitant um and is there any other sort well, of look let, let me let, yes. me let me interrupt you there and just say yeah. to illustrate this point and to really nail it down yes in in our classes at the anu we never let the junior teachers teach the beginners classes yes. it was only ever the experienced teachers and yet in most systems as you know whether you're talking about yoga or yoga or martial arts or whatever normally yes. you have to work through the junior teachers in order to work with the guru or the master I that's complete yes. nonsense the beginners yep. beginners need the best teachers in fact yes. in fact i would go further and say anyone can teach an intermediate or an advanced class just for the reasons you expressed a second ago because they all yep. know what they're doing yes. right yeah so why is it it's it's just a it's a, a sheer the, the way that most of these things are structured is all about i have to say it's all about patriarchy and it's all about power and it's all about main, making the resource seem scarcer than it really is and that's why you have to work through the junior teachers to get to the senior teacher that's just a crazy way of working in our opinion 
we, we do yeah. it the other, the other way around. And so Olivia yeah. and I, we, we always work with beginners and so do Jennifer and the other people that you know. They are our best yeah. teachers and they exclusively work with beginners and then every now and again they might do an intermediate or an advanced class just for fun. Yes, understood. But good teachers, you need a good teacher if you're a beginner and we have focused our work on that solely. Yes, that's brilliant. And um, if, if people are struggling for whatever reason to start, whether it's barriers, um, physical or mental, um, what is the best advice that you can give those people? Well, the, I'll, I can be, I'll have to be a bit blunt here. Yes. Um, but this, let's call this tough love. Yes. The greatest barrier, in fact, to starting any practice is your own mind. Mm -hmm. we, we, as human beings, we're immensely creative, but unfortunately our creativity can often be um, a real limitation for us as well. So, for example, if I said to someone, well, you've come to me because you've said that you're, there's constant mental chatter and you need to learn how to relax, um, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'm going to give you the advice of doing this practice twice a day, and it's going to take you half an hour twice a day, and the person will say straight away, I just don't have that, I don't have that kind of time. I cannot yeah. afford in my life to spend time lying around on the floor doing nothing. And I, in, in which case I would answer, well, actually you need to do two hours a day, not one. <laughs> and because the, the, here's the thing, and I know it's a funny thing to say, but the fact is your own mind will create the reason not to do something. So if yeah. it's stretching or whatever, that, you'll say, the, the mind will come up with something like, well, look, I can't even bend down and touch my toes, so I certainly can't get down on the floor. Well, what we say, for example, when we're teaching people to get up and down off the floor, and I know you know this, we'll say, put a strong chair next to you, reach out and hold the back of the chair and the seat of the chair, bend your legs slowly, make sure you're supported and lower yourself to the floor. Now let's see that and let's, let's go on from there. And as soon as you get someone down onto the floor and you show them how to do this or how to do that, or it might be that you give them chair exercises only for the first month or two, once they stop thinking about why they can't do something and grapple with the, the skill level of the exercise that you give them, which is appropriate to their physical self, the actual self that's turning up in the, in the gym or the teaching studio that day, once people actually get out of the space of I can't do this and I can't do that to I'll cautiously try this or try that, the battle is won. Yes. They're often running then. Yep. That's great. And you you break that down into small chunks to help people achieve that. Yes. yes. Well that's, that's what that's what our absolute beginner stretching series does. It literally starts with the most basic movements sitting on a chair. Yes. Because everyone can do it. There's literally not a person on the planet, even if they're in a wheelchair, who can't do those simple basic exercises, the neck exercises, some shoulder exercises, some simple spinal twists, some simple flexions, some simple extensions, all done sitting. And yes. that gets the person out of the head centre, as we say, and into the physical centre or the moving centre. And then you experience that from this perspective rather than this perspective, that changes everything. Yes. And if, uh, if as a teacher, um, you experience some pain yourself or some uh, degree of discomfort, do you go back to those principles yourself? We, we never, never leave those principles, Janine, ever. Yes. Um, in fact, it's just like meditating or breathing or any of those other things, the beginner's yes. practices the beginner's practices are, well, in Tibetan Buddhism, they, they talk about milk, blood, and bone practices. Yes. Milk practices are for beginners, beginners, and blood practices for intermediate, and bone practices for advanced students. The, pre the practices we're talking about now are milk, blood, and bone practices. They do yes. not change whether you, whether you can sit in splits, front splits, side splits, as I know you can, or not. Yeah. It makes it, 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 you still do those beginner's practices. Why? Yeah. Because there's something to be felt there, there's something to be experienced there, there are ranges of movement to be re-explored there. Yes, that's I, I guess the key, because every day is a different day with exercise. It might be the minor angle change or it might just be that your mind's in a different space and it listens to your body more uh, intuitively. So coming back to the basics is, is really useful. And in terms of pain management, um, is there 
is there something to get who to get people in a better place to be able to take on all of those things when they're actually in pain at the time? Yes. Or is it? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. And look, to, just to pick up on an earlier point that you made, and then I'll come back to the pain point. Sure. The earlier point was we say the body is actually different every day. Yes. Does it feel different to you? And people will say, no, I don't know what you mean. Well, and then we say, oh. well, try this. How does that feel? So yeah. that's some little part of an exercise, let's say. And then the next week we'll say, okay, let's do that thing again. How does that feel? And then this realization yes. happens. Oh, my God, that feels different today. And we say, yes, yeah. your body is actually different every day. In fact, we say yeah. your body is talking to you all the time but we either don't understand the language or we're deaf to what it's saying all uh, the time. Yes. There, there are 10,000 channels of communication from your body to you available to you, but most of us have become experts at repressing those sensations because mm -hmm. I'm going to be successful. I'm going to sit in this chair and I'm going to finish this report before close of business. I'm under the, under the hammer, I'm under the pump because my boss wants me to do this, but not any of that. I'm going to ignore my body. My body said three hours ago, I absolutely need to get up and walk around and go and get a drink of water. But I'm going to ignore that because this is more important. And so yeah. what, what you're doing with a lifetime of developing that new habit, even though you don't know you're developing a habit, is yeah. you're developing the habit of not listening to what your body is saying. Yeah. So getting to the pain question now, because they're actually tied intimately yes, together, learning how to relax is the way in for someone who's in pain. Yes. We, we have had people come to us who are taking heavy doses of opioids and opiate-like drugs. Yeah. Um, and who have, once they've learned how to relax, they've found in working together with their doctor, they've found that they can reduce their medication quite quickly. And it always comes as a shock because some of these people have been taking these medications, as you know, for 10 or 20 years. Yes. But when you show the body a new way of being, all sorts of possibilities that you cannot imagine before you experience them open up. Yes, understood. And people need to be open to just listening, not necessarily setting goals to begin with. Do you think that still applies? Very yes. much so. In fact, in fact, as a culture, we are absurdly over goal oriented. Here we have a body that we live in, this most magnificent machine. Well, a machine is doing a yeah. disservice. It's far better than a machine. It's a self healing organism. That's what it is. Yeah. It is, in fact, it's self healing and, and it keeps on healing up until the day you draw your last breath. Yeah. Now, instead of celebrating that and learning, well, actually, do, have you ever seen a user's manual for the human body? No. no. That's our work. Our work yes, is, the, is. Is, is the the manual you were never given. And the yes. only way to know what's inside that manual is not to read about it, but to experience it. That's what our yes. work is about. It is showing you how to open that book, the book of you, and yes. how to change those aspects which are painful to you, how to reduce the aspects which are not attractive to you, or whatever it is that we're yes. talking about. How to be more comfortable in your own body. That's such an important point. And I guess what's drawn me back to reading your books over the years again and again is um, my mind's got two spheres. Um, I've got two sons who are engineers and we think mechanically and biomechanically. Um, but to be able to bring that other feel, what you feel, to trying to get that balance in your biomechanics, which is so relevant to arthritis. You know, there's some good things that are in the medical field about, you know, aligning the body um, as, you know, in that initial assessment phase for arthritis um, and uh, applying those principles, but therefore then understanding the role that everything else has to play, um, stretching strength, relaxation, the habits of daily life, all of those sort of things and finding your own way of, I you know, love how you're, you're talking about the habits that you don't know you don't have, um, identifying those and bringing them back in. So um, if, if people are st 
still struggling after all that we've said um, and talked about with that concept. Is there anything that that we haven't spoken about yet that might help? Well, we there are all sorts of support systems available, and I'm sure that your organisation is one of those support systems. Yes. But let me give you an example from our um, little part of the universe. We have something called the forums. We have an active forum. We have over 3,000 members in that forum. And I suppose on a daily basis, probably 20 or so people post questions, different questions at different times. But somebody on the forum, somebody who's part of that community, we call it the stretch therapy community, someone will answer. And so what we've found is that someone who's got back problems or knee problems or shoulder problems or neck problems or whatever, they will describe their difficulties and someone else, not me, not Olivia necessarily, but we do visit the forum every day, someone will make a suggestion and it's probably something that we might not have thought of ourselves. And so my strong suggestion is to belong to a users group or a, a community group where the interest and the, mm, the focus is on this particular set of difficulties. I see. Well, it, because you get support from, if, if, if someone, for example, has gone through that barrier, let's call it a barrier, who yes. has embraced the possibility of changing the, the experience of their daily life, that person who has the same problem that you have is someone that you can listen to and you, you'd be much more likely to take their advice than some doctor, some overweight man who's sitting on the other, weight of a t on the other side of a table who doesn't do any exercise, why should you why should you take their perspective on board? I personally wouldn't. Yeah. You see what I mean? I, I guess a, a doctor know, or a GP knows the person's other medical history. Um, and I understand that, you know, that that pathology is really important in a diagnosis in terms of actually listening to the body itself and what it's saying on that changing everyday concept, that's where people can be best their own masters in a way. The, the GP gets to see you at the time of illness, yes. Please don't think that I'm having a go at GPs, I'm not. In, not at in all, fact, yeah. In, just... in fact, I, I can tell you that some of my best friends are general practitioners and yes, I, 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 per remember that. I yes. personally hate the fact that general practitioners are undervalued in our culture. They are just, they've become referral people yes, you know, to the people who really understand what your problem is all about. No, a good GP has a deep understanding of a very wide range of things. And yes, of course, in addition to medication that you might be taking as well. Um, a good GP, and we know plenty of them around here, good GPs can give you life advice, which is priceless. Yes, priceless. Absolutely. And it may, yes. it may be, um, a recommendation of the sort that you've made. We would say if you live in a community, for example, like Canberra, where there are plenty of stretch therapy teachers around, you can guarantee that if you go to one of those classes, there'll be someone there with the problem that you have. Yes. Who, who can say, you know, I, this was me a year ago or two years ago. Now look, look, these are the things I can do. This is what I feel in my body. That is, it's so inspiring to come across someone. Yes. You might recall some very old um, students in the classes um, at the ANU. In fact, the guy that I used to demonstrate full front splits on the back of the book Stretching and Flexibility, yes. um, he had only been a student with us at that stage for seven years. He had the best front splits I've ever seen, perfectly square hips and a purely extended back leg, which is extremely rare, even in dance yes. that's rare. Absolutely. Um, and he did not start work with us until he was 62 years old. He was 67 when that photograph was taken and he had no flexibility. He, yes. He, I won't go into his own particular problem that brought him to us, but he literally transformed himself and he certainly felt a huge amount better in his body as a result of doing this work. Plus he was an absolute inspiration to new people for us, yes. not because he was trying to be an inspiration, but I would say when someone says, oh, look, I've got this problem or that problem, uh, and I want to talk to someone about it, go and talk to this guy. He knows all about that particular problem. Yes. And look, uh, since um, working with you, I've, I've also gone 
into the Pilates realm, and I guess the simplicity of that and it's embedded in, in what you do, is that it's a concept to just try and get everything uh, in grace. Mm. That's something that they use constantly. But in balance through uh, that that approach that you take where you listen, you learn, adapt, understand that it's different every day. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things that I guess uh, I... People who need convincing to start their journey, I will say it is even better if you are starting not from a sporting background or not from fit or not from anywhere because you can therefore start from scratch, listen to your body. There's less faulty movement patterns or other things or other mind patterns that have been created through sport or training. Oh, Janine, words of, of, of deep wisdom. And let, let me just mention the experiences that we've had along the same lines. We used to run um, strength classes as well at the ANU, as well as stretching yeah. classes, as you know. And and uh, Olivia, if she, if she were here, would agree with this. We would much rather teach a complete beginner female student than anyone, any male student who thinks he knows what he's doing, or someone worse who comes from a bodybuilding background, mm. where it's all about appearance, not function. And you're saying that as a, a former yes. Olympic weightlifter, yes. so <laughs> a, absolutely, and former bodybuilder too. And I did some powerlifting. Yeah. I mean, lots of different things. These are all the fascinations that one gets engaged with as a young man. That's how they. Yeah. That's how they go. Uh, much prefer to work with a complete beginner. And as you say, it's because they don't have bad habits. And but there's another dimension to it. They're an empty cup. Ooh. They can learn because the cup yeah. is not full. Yeah. We we have had so many people come to us and say, oh, I've heard what you do up here because our gym was on the, the second floor or the third floor, actually, as you know. We've yeah. heard what you do. But, uh, and then they'd sort of stand back a bit and say, but, you know, I do this and I do that and I do something else. They want to tell you their life story and all the things that they know about. And then somewhere at the end of that conversation, they wind down and then they say, so what can you do? Um, and then, you see, you have to then, then you've got the difficulty, well, this person's already painted the picture of their life and how they are and what they can do. And so what can I offer to that? They've already, they've got a complete picture there. Whereas when someone walks up the stairs and says, look, I absolutely know nothing about any of this yeah. stuff, but I really, I've seen some of your students or I know someone who does this or uh, orienteering is very big at the university. I know someone who, or two people who are orienteers who are your students and they're just the best orienteers that we know and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, I've decided I would like to learn what they have learned. Now that, yeah. you have to be a student. And, and I think in our culture, a very great many students have forgotten how to be students. Yes, I understand. And so, uh, and I think we can sometimes give them freedom to not have to stay within what they've thought that they have. and. Yes. and so our catch cry with, with arthritis is freedom from arthritis and I think that can yes. apply to freedom to, to listen to where your body's at and how it changes every day and be empowered to, to, to move. Freedom, yeah. freedom to explore. Yes. The invitation to explore, how powerful is that? It, and and look, empowerment. Yeah. We, the as you know, I was a master's student and PhD student at the ANU when the feminist movement was at its absolute height. Yeah. And the feminists were the first people to talk about empowerment publicly, but mm. we were talking about empowerment even before then because that's exactly how we viewed our own work. Yeah. How, how to empower yourself? Yes. Not, not going to an expert to be told how to think or how to do this with your body or that with your body, but rather, and this is just absolute gold, to learn what my body needs. Yes. Which no one can tell you. In fact, something that yes. you might recall from your first beginner class, and I, I remember the first time I said this publicly, it was at a fitness convention, and uh, I remember <laughs> that, I, I, remember, I remember the group, just the audience just being horrified. Yes. But I, I said, well, let me tell you how we start with beginners in our exercise classes. And I said, we have, we have something like 200 new beginners every semester. So we're talking about a wide and deep experience of working with complete beginners. Yes. And I say, I sit people down, I, make, I look around the room, I make sure that I've actually got everyone's eye line, and I say something like, we will have no sympathy for anyone who hurts themselves in class. And you can see people 
rear back like, oh my God, that's such, a, that's such an aggressive, horrible thing to say. And then I went yeah. on to say, because we're going to treat you like adults. <laughs> and here's the thing, it doesn't matter how good a teacher you are, no one can see inside your body. We yeah. can only give you ways to learn to see inside your own yeah. body. And so, right from the very first exercise, exploring the very first part of the first exercise, you have to take responsibility for yourself and you have to decide how far is enough. Yeah. What does it feel like when I get into this position, when I bring my arm across my body like this, what does that feel like? The most important question. And I said, and you'll find, it's a surprise, the surprising thing, it's, it's intermediate and advanced students who hurt themselves, not beginning yeah. students. And the advanced students hurt themselves because they're the kind of people like you and me who say, oh yeah, I can do side splits, look at this push themselves down into side split, but the body actually doesn't want to do side splits just then and there. Yeah. If you say, oh, I am a person that can do side splits, you push yourself a bit, and guess what? You've just torn something. Now, I've yeah. done that. I know you've done that in the past. But the, the beginner, the complete beginner, doesn't actually do that. They go into a position and they ask themselves, if they're following our approach to it anyway, what does that mm. feel like? And if yeah. you're actually attending to the feelings, the body will stop you before any injury can take place but you, yeah. have, you have to be doing it slowly and you have to be doing it gently while listening to what the body is telling you you know what i'm saying i mean you know all this stuff anyway and look, and unfortunately i think i mentioned to you once in past years i feel like i'm being torn apart but i have stopped at that feeling and i've never injured myself in the last 25 years and that's the reason why it's the feeling rather, you know, and being guided into that is important. And I, I guess that's why um, when we were presenting back however long ago it is, I was presenting on self-massage mm -hmm. and it was a similar thing, that empowering just to give yourself the uh, ability to relax so that you could feel. Yeah. When you're tense, it is harder to feel, whether it's physical we're talking self-massage or yes. whether it's exercise and application yes. of the principles so i love how that's embedded in what you do and it's you know uh with that whole context where do you see the actual strength exercise fitting in where does strength come into those those major concepts of of relaxation and meditation well let me let me take a jump back into something you just said a second ago that's extremely interesting um, the fight or flight response is hardwired into the body and mm. every time you try to make the body do something it doesn't want to do it never responds to stress by opening, lengthening and relaxing it always responds by tightening, closing and protecting Yes. this is hardwired in our system and so, yes. and so to try and force the body to do something it doesn't want to do tears are in your future, you know, it's, just <laughs> not, it's not going to work and, yeah. so, and so the question becomes, okay, well, if that's the prevailing context, how do we work with this? And that's why the listening inviting perspective becomes so important. How, yeah. how do we open that stretch window? Mm. How do we work with the body? And it's, it's completely consistent with everything you've said. You cannot do any self-massage if you're resisting. And resisting is what the flight or fight response is about because although there's been a huge amount of research done into the corticosteroid part of the fight or flight response, you know, mediated by the adrenal glands, on a day-to-day -day basis that's actually not anywhere near as important as the tension I'm holding. Every time the fight or flight response is stimulated, your body increases in tension. Yes. That's how it works, but no one ever talks about that part yes. of it. But no, in, term, in, in terms of the experience of living in your own body, that's actually far more important and far more significant on a daily basis because you're learning the habit of being tense yes. than, than the adrenal response. I mean, if something jumps out unexpectedly while you're working, walking down an alley at night time, your heart will speed up and all that fight or flight response will manifest. But when you realise, oh, it's only just the neighbour's cat, they will die down quickly. But yeah. if you're habit is to be tense, you could stay tense for hours after that because you haven't learned how to let that go. Our that work is about letting go. Yes. And so to, to now talk about the strength dimension, 
One, yes. of our, one of the sayings in our work is no unnecessary tension, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the context. But, yep. if you, but if you, my favorite example, if you want to do a chin up, you're going to have to generate considerable tension. So we, yeah. so we talk about necessary or desirable tension versus unnecessary or undesirable tension. Most yes. of the tension that people have is habitual and it's unnecessary and it's definitely undesirable. But yes. when you do strength work, you are creating tension with the desire to be able to create more tension in the future. That's getting stronger. Yes. That's, what, that's what all it is. Yes. And, and so, and so, like two, yes. so, so two things. One is that your listeners will not know unless they know our work that we do active work in the end of the range of movement in all exercises once people pass that beginner's point. Yes. Con contract relax approach. Yes. But what most people don't realize is that using that as an aid to become more flexible also makes you incredibly stronger too. That's Absolutely. what people don't realize. And also too, yes. it makes you strong at a part of the range of movement that conventional strength training doesn't touch, which is the ends of the range of movement. And it's those end ranges where people hurt themselves when they do something unexpected. So our yes. systems, are, even the stretching work itself is a strengthening discipline as well as a relaxing discipline but if you want to go further if you want to be able to learn how to do a chin up and you know yourself from the work that we did at the ANU half of our students were female in every class we ever did whether it be strength class or stretching class half male half female we never policed that it just manifested like that the thing that most women want to learn how to do when we're in the university context anyway they will sidle up to you and say I'd really like to learn to do a chin up and every woman can do a chin up with the right preparation. Every woman can. And yeah. I'll never forget this one woman, I remember she did three chin ups in a row, a full perfect slow chin ups, and she got off that chin up bar and she came over to me and she said, That feels fantastic. She was yeah. so excited about the sensation, novel one for her, of feeling yeah. strong. And I said, Yes, it feels great. Don't tell everyone, but yes, it feels fantastic. <laughs> And I, oh, look, I love that story and I love how you say that she did it slow because oh. it takes so much control to do yes. something slowly than it does to do something oh. quickly. And I, yes. I say that probably at least once a month in my teaching. It's better to do something three times slow and efficiently than 20 times quickly. Oh. You do yes. have that feeling of control and it is empowering. It is. Um, it's true empowerment yes. if you think about it. Empowerment. I feel yeah. powerful. It's yeah. fantastic, Janine. Yes. And 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 we and especially for women. Yes. Especially. Exactly. And I think it, it sort of it helps with all of those other things that we try and embody, which is the biomechanics and the getting the the resetting. Yes, they're, they're all intertwined. Intertwined yeah. like a like a glove, a hand in a glove. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Well, let, I, me, let, me, my, let me ask you a question, if I may, about, yes. about your organisation. Let me ask you how your organisation can help someone who has arthritis. I'm interested and it's certainly something that we'll talk about to our other listeners as well. Yes, thank you. Well, as Arthritis New South Wales, we've got a, a broad coverage of, um, you know, people who live in metropolitan areas, uh, regional areas, rural areas. And we have support groups in some areas. We have uh, programs of, of water exercise for those that that's what they're comfortable mm -hmm. doing. We have strength and balance. The beauty of COVID is also that we have put more things online than we ever have. Yeah. Um, and so there are those options for people who, who can't access, uh, you know, face-to-face -face options. And um, a new empowering you series, uh, which includes get moving, uh, a series of get moving exercises, which is simply you know those those strategies. Fantastic. Um, yeah, which is wonderful. And and um, I've just written an article for our magazine on, on s stretching from different perspectives, mm. um, which is why you know I talked to you a little while uh, ago, and also. We're doing one on meditation for the next uh, magazine, just to give that. So we try and give that really balanced perspective. Because yes, so go on. May, may there, I know from my own experience teaching these things that 
There are, I mean, you could, al- you could almost say that our community is divided in half. Those who hear the word meditation and are interested in it, and those who hear the word meditation and think, ooh, um, incense, um, yes. cr- crystal, blah, 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 that's not for me. Yes. Now, the, the reason why I specialize in lying relaxation is that it doesn't have any of those things attached yes. to it. Now, I can tell you frankly that lying meditation and lying relaxation are identical in its beginning practice. Identical. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, my suggestion is, for what it's worth, um, recommend the lying relaxation instead because, in my experience, a greater proportion of your community will not find that idea unattractive. Yeah. And we have the resources, free resources, um, hundreds of them that can get people started on that journey and then if they decide they want to do some meditation as well well then the door is open then yes understand so yes so you must be able to relax before you can even think about meditation so that's the best place to start in my opinion but i have to tell you that that is it was when i started teaching in asia that was a totally novel idea totally novel in fact in fact, so many of the people that were having trouble, here's the most common thing, when you, when you end a meditation retreat, and some of these retreats are a week long or two weeks long or a month long, and they're all silent. Most people are not aware of this, but in Asia, all retreats are silent. So people yeah. don't talk to one another, they simply turn up in the hall, they listen to the teacher do the Dharma talk for the day, or, or the, in my case, the teacher that's doing the lying relaxation practice for the day and so on, and then they go off and they do their sitting practice and this moving practice, the walking practice, Mm -hmm. but at the end of the meditation retreat, the one thing that everyone talks about is how painful it was to sit still and do nothing. That's for Western people in particular, but also Asian people. And the point is, it's tension that stops you doing those things. And when Patrick saw this deeply, he invited me into the workshops. And now those workshops, they do an hour of gentle stretching and mobilization exercise First, First okay. and people, people who'd done his retreats before said the experience on this retreat was totally and completely different as a result of doing that. So yes, meditation, if you develop a connection to your body, and that's what relaxation is about, it's about a schema, an approach to developing a connection to your body, and you're successful in that, and you can feel your body, and you can let unnecessary tension go, you're progress in sitting meditation practice the standard ordinary orthodox meditation practice will be supercharged i think Mm. not Mm. just improved yes and that has been the experience of literally thousands of meditators that we have worked with it's quite remarkable yes that's uh that's brilliant i have just looked at the clock and realized that we have spoken for well over an hour it feels like five minutes okay (laughs) Um, oh, is there anything that that you feel we could um, say as we as we start to wrap up that could be of benefit to people with arthritis, any musculoskeletal condition, any yes. any pain? I my strong suggestion would be to consider gently inviting yourself to explore yourself. Because, nice. because, and I'm, speak, I'm speaking, as you know, from someone that used to have debilitating and super severe back pain myself back, back in yeah. the old days. I mean, that's another story. We'll talk about that another time, perhaps. But beginning this journey is the hardest part of the journey. Yeah. Let, let throw your fears to the wind and start doing something today, something gentle something nurturing, something that will help you remake the severed connection between yourself and your body. And I say that because in the vast majority of instances of the sorts of problems that we've been talking about, there is something in your daily lifestyle that is contributing to that problem. If you think about it. Yes. Whether, whether the arthritis is wear and tear, whether it's a reactive arthritis or all the different kinds of arthritis that there are, or whether it be RSI yep. or back problems or neck problems, these things don't happen in a vacuum, they're happening in your body. And there are things that you can do to alter the course of these things, all of these things, 
But first, you have to have a connection to the body itself. So start by learning to relax. And it doesn't matter what your physical problem is. The acquisition of that skill, learning how to relax and to be more comfortable in your body, will always help whatever it is that you're suffering from, without fail. Without fail. Uh, that is such a brilliant message, and I'm so glad we've captured that um, on on audio because uh, it's um, priceless. <laughs> so on that that wonderful note, I will let you go. Um, it, this has been an absolute privilege Thank to you. talk to you again, and uh, yeah, on behalf of, of Arthritis New South Wales and our many many members. Thank you. Oh, Janine, I really appreciate the opportunity. As you know, and I know this is true for yourself too, as teachers, yeah. all we ask for is an audience to talk to or to interact with, someone yeah. to talk to, someone to listen to. Yeah. That is that is why we do these things. And if, if this is yeah. any use to anyone, we're extremely grateful. Thank you. It's brought tears to my eyes. You've reminded us of why we do or what we do, hmm. and uh, and you've kept me going for the next twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'll say bye bye now. Thanks to everyone, bye. everyone listening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.